Good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my good friend, Taiman Jafari, for his kind and gracious help in bringing me here. My uh, wonderful publisher, Z Publisher, Rubini, Julian, Tamsin, for their generous help in bringing me to London. And I would like to thank Marxism Festival here and express my absolute delight to be here in the company of my colleagues and comrades. It is too sad to hear that Tony Negri is too ill and Leila Khalid is too hot for uh, British authorities to allow her to come. But nevertheless, I am honored to be in your company. The uh, most immediate reason that I'm here is the book that has just been published by Zed, uh, The Arab Spring. Uh, the first thing I must say is my uh, unending gratitude to Tamsin O'Rear, my, uh, my, my editor. Uh, I began writing this book last summer, early in the summer I began to write. I was supposed to give her 100,000 words, but by the time I stopped because of the tendonitis, uh, <laughs> Uh, I had given her 260,000 words, and from a mass of just going in all sorts of directions, Tamsin sculpted a uh, readable and, if I may say so, fascinating book uh, <laughs> <laughs> myself. So in no, no uh, significant degree, this is, this is owed to Tamsin. Uh, now, the first thing that I have to say about this book, that this is a book as an act of solidarity with the revolution, with the Arab revolutions that are happening from Morocco to Syria, from Yemen to Bahrain. And I have written it, uh, as I say in the introduction, by way of joining the revolutionaries, for example, in Tahrir Square or Manama Square or Azadi Square, in, with their slogans, a sha'ab yurid sqat al-nizam, people demand the overthrow of the regime. This is my way of joining them in that cry, people demand the overthrow of the regime. Now, that regime uh, can be and must be interpreted in multiple ways. One of them is the figurehead, for example, Hosni Mubarak or uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, whoever is the figurehead that has to be changed. But obviously, this slogan refers to far more than that figurehead. It has political and social and cultural implications. So it's a different calculus involved when we talk about the overthrow of the regime. One of the principal ideas that I put forward in the book is the necessity of changing the regime of knowledge. How do we get to know about this uh, uh, sets of revolutions? As you know, these sets of revolutions are not limited to any one country. And the most significant aspect of them in the Arab and the Muslim world is their transnational disposition. Uh, things that are happening in Egypt have extremely important consequences for the rest of the Arab world. Uh, so it is not wise for us to think, oh, the six million Libyans are, uh, uh, how are they going to go through these revolutions? Or uh, the tiny island of Bahrain, which is usually not on the map of the Arab revolutions, how are they going to uh, manage? The fact is that uh, the, uh, the Arab world has a synergetic relationship uh, uh, in itself. Uh, is, uh, Egypt and Syria are particularly important in these uh, revolutions. And as you see, no two countries, even in the four countries that the top dictator has fallen, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Yemen, and uh, What's the first one? Libya. Libya. Uh, they are very different political cultures in many significant ways. And the mode of revolutionary uprising varies from moderately peaceful Tunisia to extremely uh, violent because of the NATO intervention uh, in Libya. But they have catalytic impact on each other. And that, uh, the reason, for example, these days we are so fascinated with the presidential election in Egypt uh, is precisely of the, because of the consequences in Egypt for the rest of the Arab world. And the particularly nasty twist that things have uh, assumed in Syria equally is, uh, is important. So I'm not particularly uh, uh, sad or disappointed that there is no global co coverage of Bahrain, despite the fact that the Bahraini uprising is 
is integral to the rest of the Arab revolutions and uh, uh, the ruling regime in collaboration with the Saudi uh, army and the uh, Gulf Cooperation uh, Council aided and abetted by the British uh, government and the British army, the, the, the invading army of Saudi Arabia that went to Bahrain to quell the legitimate uprising of the majority of the Bahrainis violently have been uh, trained by the British. So uh, it is very important. This is a season of exposing hypocrisies of all sorts. That if something is happening in uh, Egypt and Libya, you may support it. But if it's happening in Yemen, you are not uh, support, or in Bahrain, you are not uh, supporting or exposing it. That those are the sorts of uh, issues that are involved. My one of the principal issues that I put, put forward is that the existing modes of knowledge production that we have in departments of political science or area studies or even sociology or cultural studies or anthropology are not sufficient in terms of metaphors and narratives and theories and ideas in order to deal with these sets of revolutions. These sets of revolutions as all other kinds of revolutions, going back to the European revolutions of 1848, catch revolutionaries by surprise. Uh, from Brother Marx all the way down here, they, uh, it, it is not that uh, revolutions follow theories, in fact theories follow revolutions. First revolutions happen and then people are trying to figure out what the hell did they actually happen and, and uh, uh, trying to come to terms with it. The Arab revolutions are not an exception to this rule. Now, the other problem with them when we call them Arab <coughs> revolutions or Arab Spring or Arab uprisings is that they, it, the expression is both revelatory but also concealing. Things are happening from Djibouti to Somalia to, uh, to, the, re to the rest of the sub-Sahel Africa, but we don't, it doesn't register with us because they are not part of the Arab world. They are part of a different set of geography. And as a result, one other idea I put forward in, in the book is the idea of liberation geography. Namely, our minds are being liberated from the received geography of East and West and North and South. Now, usually, the uh, division of North and South is along the lines of labor migrations. You may recall at a very critical point during the Libyan uh, uprising, Saif al-Islam uh, Gaddafi, uh, a graduate of, uh, of LSE, as you know, uh, said that if we go if we go, look at the pronouns, if we go, they would be in Lampedusa. Now, we meaning the Libyan regime, they meaning African uh, uh, mig labor migrations. Lampedusa is the gate into, uh, into the rest of Europe. So one of the critical issues that may explain the intensity of NATO involvement in the Mediterranean basin the opportunity given to the NATO by uh, Gaddafi is the flexing of the military and diplomatic and political muscles of NATO to control the uh, Mediterranean basin in a manner to control labor migration. At the time that Europe, as you well know, is facing one of the most serious critical crises of its history in the aftermath, particularly of the formation of European Union. Today, your own prime minister in this country, the day before yesterday, said, no, we are going to seal our, our uh, borders and Greeks are not welcome here. But at the same time, Financial Times reported that the prime minister of Portugal has said, though, that the, uh, the Portuguese under the age of 26, they should consider jobs in Angola and Brazil. So the, the pattern of labor migration is not only from the south to the north, it's also from north to the south. Uh, from labor unrest in Greece to indignatos to, in Spain to a student uprising in, in UK. The, uh, and if we extend it across the Atlantic in the 99% movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement, etc. This is a global phenomenon. Now, the, it, it, is, it, it is helpful to realize that we are facing with a global revolutionary uprisings from the Arab world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, but it's equally important to keep in mind that we are talking within different political uh, cultures, and as a result, they should not be completely assimilated uh, into each other. Now, because of these reasons, my first and foremost, the reason that I 
many people ask me, why did you rush to write this book? Don't you think it's, it's foolhardy to write about the rev a set of revolutions that is unfolding? Uh, have you not said something in it that you may regret and become embarrassed in two years, three years from now? The answer, that, that there are two answers or multiple answers. I'll share a couple of them. One of them is that, as I said, this is an act of political solidarity. It's not an act of distant, interpretative, oh, them Arabs, they did this and that, maybe uh, it means this, but it could be the other thing. No. I am in this book with my brothers and sisters in Tahrir Square saying with my Persian ac accent the Arabic expression as Shah Yuri the Salat and Nizam. If one of the ideas that I have put po forward may turn out to be ridiculous, I live with the consequences. <laughs> However, the other point is that my, my conviction that we are at a stage that we have to stick our neck forward, whether we are professors or academics or activists or journalists, or, a polit or whatever it is that, uh, that we are, we have to join this action. The luxury of standing aside and that I'm, a, that I'm an observant, as I say again in the book, I'm a participant, not just an observant. This is not an anthropological. This is not they, this is me. They are, I am part of them and I'm joining them, whether they are the uh, uh, Greek labor unions in Athens or the Indignato in Spain or the students, the student uprising from Canada to UK, these are my students. These are the students who can't afford higher education. Higher education is becoming systematically an elitist proposition. The students in the US, in Canada, in Europe, they cannot afford that kind of education while the university is becoming more and more globalized and university uh, 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 chancellors and, and, and presidents, uh, such as my own university, make obscene uh, uh, salaries uh, on the amount of three million dollars with which you can run three departments in, in my university. Why? Because of systematic historical corporatization of universities. So there's nothing, there's no, none of us are immune. As I say in my courses on colonialism, colonialism is not something that happened there. Colonialism, I, I teach in Harlem. Colonialism is something that happens here, right here as we speak. To me, colonialism is abuse of labor by capital times geography. There's nothing abused, there, uh, there, nothing unusual. Uh, there are, uh, what you call it, the uh, uh, sweatshops. Uh, sweatshops, as, as many sweatshops in downtown Manhattan where I live, as they are in Guatemala and, uh, and, and so forth. Makes no uh, difference. So, the, the, one of the, the, the second reason why I, 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 I rushed into writing this is the necessity of re-examining our concepts, our ideas, our theories, our, our imaginative geography for us to be able to cross the psychological barrier between the West and the rest. Where exactly is this West? Uh, are the unemployed, the uninsured, uh, 35 million underinsured under Americans, are they West? Where exactly is the West? The infant mortality rate and life expectancy in, in Newark and, and in, in Bronx and in Harlem, uh, is, they are worse than Bangladesh. Where exactly in the West is this? And there are beneficiaries of this system also in Bangladesh, also in Kuwait, also in Bahrain. What sort of solidarity I, as a Muslim or as an Iranian, I'm supposed to have with a fat a Kuwaiti or Iranian uh, uh, conglomerate, uh, a corporate, uh, watching his cholesterol in a fancy restaurant in Europe? What, my solidarity is with the illegal laborer uh, washing dishes and their, two, their Islams are not identical. These are two different uh, Islams. The same is with Christianity. You have a Christianity that represses and suppresses, and you have liberation theology uh, in, in Christianity, or Judaism. So religion is not the issue. The issue is the combination of race, class, and gender. Look at these three factors, and then, uh, and then play theoretically, conceptually, uh, 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 politically, these three conceptual factors of class, race, and gender against the unfolding uh, revolutions, and you can't uh, go wrong. So these are the two reasons that I, that I wrote this book without any hesitation, it, as an act of solidarity, and it uh, goes forward. Now, the other provocative uh, subtitle of the book, uh, The End of Postcolonialism, that has baffled some of uh, my friends and colleagues has to do with this. There were a number of subtitles that, that uh, Tamsin and I worked with, uh, played with, to put as subtitles. One of them was 
delay the defiance, uh, meaning that this defiance would have happened in the immediate aftermath of European colonialism that was deferred uh, because the, the illusion of post-coloniality was supposed to result in source of social justice that, that never happened. The other one was liberation geography, precisely because no longer uh, the Arab world, the Muslim world, is supposed to be to the east of some colonial officer who one day sat here in London and decided whatever was to his east is the middle or near or far east. The other is the, uh, the idea of open-ended revolution as opposed to the total revolution. Towards the end of the book, I make a very uh, uh, detailed comparison uh, analysis between a total revolution, namely a, to a revolution on the model of a Leninist takeover of the state, uh, that uh, comes and takes over the state and everything becomes hunky-dory, supposedly, in, in aftermath, aftermath of that. Uh, as opposed to an open-ended revolution, which is predicated on the active occupation of the public space, systematic, active, and progressive op occupation of the public space. In comparison, if you look at the Zuccotti part as a site of revolutionary uprising in the American case, it was not in the, until the aftermath of the Occupy Wall Street that people began to realize that, in fact, Zuccotti Park is not a public space, as in it's a private space, and uh, the, uh, the occupants could be thrown out. Now, here I take the, in the book the, the idea of Tahrir Square both as a physical space and as a, as a metaphor for the, for the, first of all, the constitution of the public space. But then, my suggestion is that the euphoria of the revolutionary moment and the fact that only in the Egyptian context, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood has the infrastructure wherewithal of mobilizing uh, their supporters to come, whereas a younger generation has to be contingent on, uh, on uh, Facebook and Twitter and so forth, the wild one uh, a phenomenon, is not sufficient for enduring uh, pace that we need in the, in the open-ended revolution. What we need is the systematic transformation of the, that public space into three, uh, at least three voluntary associations. First and foremost, independent labor unions that they can bring down the machinery of the state any moment that they want, uh, as in fact it was not until in the aftermath of labor unions joining the Egyptian revolution that actually succeeded. Second is women's rights or, uh, organizations, and third is uh, student uh, assemblies. The combination of these things is the transformation, systematic, social transformation of revolutionary violence to revolutionary force. I make a distinction between violence and force. That is, violence becomes a force. The combination of the three of them can bring down the machinery of the, uh, of the state. So, uh, as you see, this is more to a uh, Hannah Arendt conception on the public space, if you recall her comparison of the French and the, uh, and the American Revolution, rather than the, 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 the Leninist takeover of the state from which uh, everything uh, is controlled. Now, the, uh, the problem, of course, is the enduring political culture that is ma manifests itself in the secular reli religious divide. That, uh, as an example, a, a group, a delegation of Egyptian revolutionaries were uh, at my university, very much concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood takeover of the parliament, of the presidency. I'm not that concerned for reasons that I'll be happy to explain if you care. Uh, uh, and then I asked one of them, why don't you go to the mosque and, and you know, mobilize in the mosque? And she said, but I'm second. I said, but aren't you Egyptian? That, you have to appropriate the mosque into the public space, not the public space being appropriated into the mosque. In other words, you have to overcome the psychological barrier, oh, I am a, a secular. What the hell is secular? What, what does it, who gave anybody authority to define what is a Muslim? We need to reconceptualize what it means to be a Muslim. I mean, I, what I say may shock you. We have to allow for Muslim atheists. What, what, what ever ask uh, Brother Marx, you know, aren't you Jew? How, how could you really say these things? Or, or, uh, or uh, Freud or Einstein, you know, they, they, they are Einstein is Einstein, Marx is Marx, Freud is Freud. So why is it that when it comes to a Muslim, you have to be uh, sort of praying five times? I don't pray five times a day. 
I don't fast during the month of Ramadan. I don't drink water with my dinner. So, but I'm a Muslim. Okay? I mean, in this time and age of European, ghastly European Islamophobia, that Afghan kids and, and Iraqi kids, uh, kids are afraid of their naming Muhammad and Ahmad and, uh, and Zainab and Zahra, for me to say, oh yeah, I'm, an, uh, I'm not really secular, uh, Marxist, however, you know, uh, it's not good what you're doing to these Muslims. No! I am a Muslim, but I'm a Marxist Muslim. What do you want to do with it? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nightmare of Andre Friedrich. What do you want to do? <laughs> but I, so, no ideas to the new mass murderers anywhere. Uh, the, th the thing is that this is what I mean by reappropriating concepts and ideas and thoughts in order for what matters. What matters are masses of millions of labor migration, 300 million laborers roaming around the globe in search of decent living. 300 million. This is the size of the United States. 50 million under underinsured or uh, under poverty line in the United States. And then fascinating figures about twice the, the, uh, the, the poverty line, which makes it 100 million. Twice the poverty line means a husband and wife working back-breaking uh, <coughs> schedules to, to keep a roof over their uh, children's head, to provide for an education for their, uh, for their kids. The horrid, horrid condition of public education in the United States. And we have a President Obama who thinks he's the beneficiary of the 280 years of the slavery, and not only putting her own kids in, uh, in private schools, even supporting the ghastly, what we call in the United States, the, the charter schools, namely the privatization of the public, further privatization of public schools. They, they say they, the Occupy Wall Street doesn't have an agenda. This is the agenda. In, in the subways of New York, you see mothers picking up their daughters. Instead of going home to do their homework, they go to, they used to, not, not, not any longer, to Zuccotti Park to, their, to do their homeworks. That is what the fighting is about. And they require a reconceptualization of the middle class, of the uh, labor class. I mean, in the United States, labor class has disappeared. There's no such thing as labor class. It, it, or working class. It's working families. In the US, we're very much into euphemisms. Working family. Because this uh, working class, ooh, you might be a Marxist or a socialist. Uh, it be reported to uh, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so, these are among the ideas that I, that I developed. Now, the, the book actually, if you were to read it, you will see that it, it uh, navigates into details of country by country, what is happening in Egypt, what in Tunisia, what in Morocco, etc. Some of the countries that are not active, but nevertheless are very important in many other respects. And also, uh, historical distance from uh, this is specific cases, try to come with some sort of a summation. summation. Most of the ideas are put forward uh, uh, gently and, and provisionally and by way of, as I said, the uh, beginning of a conversation. Let me just conclude with the most uh, vexing site today of the Arab uh, Revolution, which is Syria. Syria, in my opinion, has a rightly become a very divisive force among the left. It would be wrong for us to silence those who uh, 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 oppose the ruling regime and, and they, uh, criticize the ghastly mass murders that are happening uh, repeatedly by pointing to the contrary revolutionaries of the Saudis and the Qataris and the Israel and the United States. It is equally wrong to underestimate the counter-revolutionary forces, the forces of Qataris, Saudis, and so forth, and silence them. Like we need multiple lenses to see better. The fact of the matter is that there are armed gangs kidnapping people in Syria for a, a ransom. And it is hard at this stage to distinguish between them and those who legitimately have picked up arms against the ghastly ruling regime. 
Right now, as I said, if you follow the literature in the left, there's very difficult, heart-wrenching decisions that people have to make. Some people are underestimating the counter-revolutionary forces and concentrating the horrid activities of the ruling regime. Some do the, exactly the opposite thing. This is a moment that we need, as in the case of a magnificent dialogue between Samir Amin and Ejaz Ahmad, I hope some of you have seen it, in which you see two leading critical thinkers of the previous generation going back and forth, particularly about Syria, but about the rest of the Arab Revolution. Samir Amin's book, magnificent book, which I just blurred, is coming out soon, and I highly recommend it. Uh, we need uh, the, uh, to breathe with two nostrils. We need to see with two eyes. We need to have uh, sculpted visions of what is happening. It is not time for us in the left to start backbiting and accusing each other that if you uh, criticize the counter-revolutionaries, oh, you, you are a supporter of the regime, or if you support the regime, oh, you are uh, on the imperialist camp. The, 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 the left is also shedding skin. We also, on the left, have to be very, very careful how to be in nuanced conversation with the un unfolding event. We need each other's insights. And the last thing that we want to do is to accuse each other of one uh, uh, false uh, accusation or, uh, or another. At any rate, I'm going to stop here. And those of you who may have seen the book or those of you who may have any questions about anything I said, uh, I would be more than happy to, uh, to respond. Thank you. Just two questions. Um, as a Latin American, I'm very interested in knowing uh, what's your opinion about the movements that are happening with different shades of color and different yeah. as a Latin American. I'm interested in knowing what Mr. Um, Dabashi thinks uh, about what's happening in Latin America uh, with different shades of color and different kinds of an ending intervention by different ways by the imperialist powers. Not now so much with arms, and, but I mean, all the interventions and all the infiltrations that are going now to, uh, are trying now to oust their governments in a legal, quote unquote, way. That is one point. Another point that interests, interests me uh, greatly is what's your opinion about this inserted uh, watchdog that the imperialist powers have um, installed in the Middle East called the State of Israel, and how does this is playing out presently. Everybody here knows how many, uh, how many the implications are of this in different shades again of policy making. But Personally, I think that this is as a, the metaphor of the oppression and the oppressed. And they are trying to have a sort of um, showcase of a big uh, concentration camp where uh, the minds are colonized permanently. For us, for us, all of us to watch, look what may happen to you. So I would like your opinion on these two points. Thank you very much. Hamida, I would like to say how um, refreshing it is to hear a partisan academic. Um, <laughs> that, you know, especially for... um, uh, it, it's a voice that's um, heard too rarely, uh, and I look forward to reading the book with great interest. I'd like to, though, just take up an issue for debate around your discussion around the state and public space, um, because it seems to me you're implying that um, these two are separated, that, that we have to focus on control of public space rather than control of the state. It seemed to me also that there was, um, if you'd like, a, an implicit uh, acceptance of what is, after all, the dominant perception of the, um, of the Bolshevik Revolution that the uh, seizure of state power was a coup rather than representative of um, workers' power and genuine 
democracy, which for me is uh, a problem, and I would argue quite forcefully against that perception. I'm not sure whether I'm misrepresenting your view there. Oh, yeah. My main point, though, would be that I don't see that these two things are in any way incompatible. On the contrary, that they are preconditions one of the other. If control of the state, seizure of state power, is simply the act of a few, doesn't represent already a dynamic by which the majority have started to seize control of what you might refer as public space, then you would be right. It would indeed be a coup. However, that once those public spaces are seized, including the workers' districts and the factories and the offices, unless we take on control of the state, the state will at best at least undermine control of public space and at worst physically destroy that control of it. And if we look at Egypt, when we think of Tahrir Square and what a fantastic um, and a crucial element that was in the movement, but then how the control of parliament, control of civil service, control of the courts, and crucially the control of the army and the police becomes the determining factor on whether that revolution will go forward or not. It seems to me that the question of force, as you put it, um, and n confronts the state itself, and we can't step back from yeah. control of it. Yeah. Sorry if I've misrepresented no, 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 things you yeah. said, but I'll be really interested in what you say. Well, I just wanted to follow up briefly on the previous speaker. My feeling about your, your juxtaposition of the open-ended revolution and the total revolution is, as for the, to as for the open-ended revolution, that been there, done that. I mean, look, I'm a veteran of the 1960s. We opened up all kinds of public space in the United States, from culture and Watergate to women's liberation and burning bras in front of the, the Miss Universe contest and so on, to the Black Panthers, to the, you know, Richard Nixon talks about being in the White House in the, in the mid-1970s as feeling like he was under a state of siege. What went wrong? Ten years later, we had Ronald Reagan, and all the, the, all the public space that we occupied was undermined, ripped off, distorted, twisted, and turned into weapons against us. So right now, look at, look at, the, look at America. There are more black people in the prisons than there were slaves in 1860. The, the, the abortion is, is unobtainable in 35 out of 50 United States. The, 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 the basic point is, without state power, all is illusion. Hi, my name is Adi Atassi. I just came from Cyprus. I'm a Syrian revolutionist, actually, and I'm really glad to listen to Dr. Hamdi. Uh, and I would like to say that because in Arabic we write from right to left, <laughs> when you mention about the uh, the revolution following the theory. In Arab words, the theory followed the revolution, just because of that, I think. <laughs> uh, second, uh, we have to consider that uh, the Arab Spring builds on the shoulders of youth, which they've been isolated at the same time out of any kind of ideologies and that it makes it more unique because they are a genuine follower, a genuine, the people who believe in it and they would like to continue work for it. And that's what we see in every uh, Tahrir Square in all the Arab countries. <clears throat> My question is um, also, uh, sorry, uh, the secularism actually, uh, it has to do something among the people who've been in, uh, uh, there is a gap, let's say, in between uh, uh, the theories of ideologies and the, what's going on in, 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 in action. And because the, uh, uh, for 50 years there is no ideology, there is no politics in Arabic words, so in that case, the, uh, the, the, uh, the religion, Islam or whatever, it, it tried to fill up that the gap so now is the time of, for us as a left, as a secularism, as whatever. We have to, to fight against that. So I think our revolution will start after the collapse 
of the regime. Now the fight is to, to put down the regime, but the, the, the fighting is, and the real fighting is going to, to be after the collapse of any kind of dictatorship. Because with these dictatorships, we will have the, the biggest dictatorship of, uh, of the religion and of the people who are trying to put it as a new uh, ideology for the coming years. And we are afraid of that. Thank you very much. I was uh, privileged enough to be in Tahir Square on the 2nd of July this year. And in the morning, my, my daughter and I crossed the square, which is actually, for those people who don't know, a big roundabout full of cars. And we crossed the square. She turned to me and she said, how did they close this square, Mum? So I said, I don't know, we'll ask someone when we get back to the hotel. We went to the museum, which is a fantastic museum. Went round it, saw all the broken bits and the old bits, fantastic. Came out of the square and we discovered how they closed the square. Because of course, it's the same day as the announcement of uh, everyone except Mubarak getting off the hook because the square filled up with people. And I have to say, as a revolutionary socialist, all my life, it was one of the most inspirational places I've ever been. Scary, but incredibly inspirational. And this is the thing about process, isn't it? It's not over yet, it's not it keeps changing, because every side, that, you know, that, that somebody, at some stage, someone is going to have to be a winner. It's either going to be their side or our side. And actually, what we do, it sounds really silly, but what we do over here makes a difference over there. The fact that we met with independent trade unions, and we give them badges and diaries and pens <coughs> and everything else, you know, all the pens that teachers all need, you know, piles of them. The fact that we talked to uh, socialists uh, uh, social over there, the fact that we met, you know, the most amazing, inspirational people, the fact that I carry a bit of Tahir Square around me, whenever I see a bullying head teacher, I rub it in my hands with, your time will come. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do over here is also important, because one of the things we started to do when we got back, because I was so enthused by this, I thought that must be something we can do. And I'm a bit of a, a solidarity freak. So we started doing these posters in Arabic, solidarity with the, with the, with the Egyptian revolution, and all those posters. I got someone to translate it so it wasn't the wrong way around, etc. and all that. And we started getting people to hold the signs up, trade unions, teachers, etc., and have their photographs put in. And then we put them on Facebook, on the Men of Solidarity Facebook. They were then translated into Arabic, and they were then put into Tahir Square. And one of the second most beautiful things I think that happened to me in my life was seeing pictures from Tahir Square from the wall with all the amazing graffiti on etc. With, with solidarity with Alfie Meadows, solidarity with people locked up in the right, it, it, in the right. And that to me, comment, is true internationalism. It's true, true international cupcakes, if you like, for those of you who know that story. One final, final thing is, I think there's two, so I'm going very quickly. When the comrade says, you didn't call for a vote for the brotherhood. To be honest, if we hadn't called for a vote for the brotherhood, who were we saying was going, the counter-revolution, the Mubarak murderers? Now, to be honest, how do we put pressure on the Brotherhood? It's by making sure they've got a good vote, making sure the squares stay full, making sure the factories stay occupied, making sure it's the schools, etc. My final thing, I've got a, a play. We're trying to raise money for, for this Men of Solidarity Network, and there's two young revolutionaries at the back who will fleece you for every penny you've got for these T-shirts. The minimum cost is £8. But we're looking for donations of £10. These were bought in Tahir Square. So next time you go and see a bullying head teacher or a bullying boss, you can wear one underneath your suit and tie. Thank you. The question is about um, uh, being neighbour to the Arab world. It's about Iran. How, uh, yeah. how do Iranian um, people uh, feel and how, what do they think of what's happening in uh, Egypt and especially in Syria? I mean, I, I think about all those who went three years ago to the, to the streets, you know, about all this green movement. How, how do you think about, what do they think about the, uh, what's happening, especially in Syria? I mean, the regime there is, it's a bit similar to, to Iran, you know, very, very dictatorial, ferocious. So what do they think about what's happening there? Thanks. I wanted to say, I've, I've read your book, um, The Fox and the Paradox, and um, I liked it very much, particularly your um, description of Israel as a, figment, a militant figment of its inhabitants' imagination. I think, that's, I think that's really, really on point. I also really like the way that you, um, you spoke about something which I think a lot of people on the quote-unquote left have been absolutely silent about, which is the collaboration of the Iranian government with the United States on the invasion of Iraq and the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, a question I wanted to ask you regarding that was what in your position, from your perception and your 
estimation somewhat <coughs> was the United States thinking when in 1998 they agreed to fund in the Iraq Liberation Act a group called the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq amongst other Iraqi opposition groups. This was a group set up by Khomeini during the Iran-Iraq war. The, the, the State Department, US Congress under Bill Clinton agreed to fund this group. Since the occupation of Iraq, the group have taken the word revolution out of their name. Hence, we can only draw the conclusion that they believe that revolution took place in 2003. Hence, we have the sectarian US-backed government as well as Iranian-backed government in Iraq today under Mr. Maliki. I wanted to see what your estimation and perception was of what the United States were actually thinking at that point. Afghanistan is a slightly different issue, so I'm not really going to get into that. I also wanted to ask you, um, you know, I have, I have a real issue with people equating Assad with Palestine when, you know, while you cannot discount support for Hezbollah, you cannot discount support for resistance, you also have to take into account why there is such dislike towards leftist movements in the Middle East and in Arab countries. We have to look at the simple fact that in 1948, almost all of the Arab Communist parties supported and recognized the state of Israel when it was established because that's what the Soviet Union did. And that is not forgotten. And when it comes to the Soviet Union and Russia, in my opinion, Khrushchev was the only one that really gave a damn about the Arabs on the Palestinian question. On to Assad, the issue of Putin and his fawning over Israel, Israel values demographics. That is what it is losing in. It's its biggest supplier of racially pure Zionists today is Russia. Mm. Putin is not going to give weapons to an Arab that he believes will fall on his countrymen's head. He's not going to give weapons to Arabs or Iranians that will harm Russians living in Israel. Israel is and must be viewed as a joint venture between the Europeans, the United States and the Russians. That is my perception. I wanted to see what you feel about, more importantly, is the US-Iran question, but the question of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian question. Thank you. Hey, man, Jeffrey. Uh, well, when uh, last year, actually, Hamid was telling me that he's going to uh, put at the subtitle post-colonialism, I said, Hamid, I'm a bit worried you're letting imperialism off the hook. What do you mean with post-colonialism and so on? And, and I'm very glad, and I, of course, I was making a joke, he hasn't let off uh, imperialism off the hook. Because it's, I think, very essential to understand what that means. It means that still the fight against imperialism is very central. But that the, the, the fight that the people in the Middle East, in Iran, in Syria, and Egypt are, 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 are making is part of a global uh, uprising. It is part of a global uprising against neoliberalism, against dictatorship, and that we cannot say to the people in Egypt or Syria that they, yeah, you only have to fight against imperialism and don't uh, uh, give a damn about uh, dictatorship or about the fact that your, your, your children are going hungry and uh, 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 being sacked from the factories and so on. So it is a global fight against imperialism because in the past decades there has been a trend of uh, a neoliberal globalization making it the fact, for instance, that Iran uh, is the biggest importer of Porsche last year. There is a rich ruling class in Iran as it is in Egypt and so on. So people want to fight their own ruling class as well as they are fighting US uh, 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 imperialism. And on the question of Egypt, I mean, the comrade who said we shouldn't call for a vote for Morsi, that would have indeed uh, meant that Shafiq would have uh, won, and that would have uh, derailed the revolution. The revolution now continues. I mean, we have challenges ahead. We have to uh, uh, fight the Morsis of the, of, of the future and uh, hold them to, to, to account. But this means that the revolution remains open-ended instead of uh, uh, counter-revolutionaries uh, 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 winning. And also about the question of Islamism and political Islam, what Hamid was saying is absolutely true. Who says that we are not talking about class when we say vote for Morsi? Those Muslims 
voting for Morsi. They are not working class. They are not working in the factories in Egypt just because they are uh, Muslims. No, they are working class and we have to relate to them. The comrade who was saying the, 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 the misery that Stalinism has brought on us, not engaging with religious people, not engaging in a respectful way with nationalist uh, 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 activists and so on, is not the mistake we have to make. We have to engage with them, we have to be there where they are fighting and continue the revolution. Just before, maybe some other comrades have already commented on this, uh, but uh, my comment is slightly different. Uh, first, it, it's really a great presentation and uh, frankly, it's one of the greatest ones, um, talking about the Arab Spring. Uh, you were talking about uh, secu secularism and uh, Islamism and so on, and I really, and I have now actually have t tweeted you uh, what you said. Uh, yes, well, me too. I am a Muslim Marxist, I'm a Muslim socialist, and I I'm really proud. And I don't really believe in um, secular environment, because the environment that we really uh, seek, I I'm just saying we, because I assume that other socials are the same, uh, is an environment in which there is true democracy, in which there is a choice to be religious or not to, to be religious, in which there is a choice for women to wear a headscarf or to wear whatever they want to. This is a really healthy environment. It is not something that it's not healthy to ban religious people from practicing their religion and the other way around. <coughs> Uh, so, because we have really seen many secular dictatorships as well. For instance, uh, where Saddam was a secular, he was never religious. And yeah, he was very open with it that he is secular. So is Bashar Assad. So, assuming that only religious people are oppressive, now this is really, uh, this is insane, this is ridiculous, really, really ridiculous, because most of the dictators that we have seen, apart from al Saud in Saudi Arabia, all of the men are secular, and indeed, even al Saud, they are also secular, but they pretend to be religious sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, really thanks, and also, what the comrades in Egypt have done is the smartest thing that uh, would that really would be done, uh, because it's what we really call crisis management, that they knew that if Shafiq would win, then it's the whole collapse of the revolution, and really, that the whole revolutionary movements will be crushed. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm John Ford, I'm a sociologist in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, in former life, I was a historian of Iran, and certainly, needless to say, I'm a huge fan of your work, and this is a book I, I'm delighted that you've written, and I look forward to reading it myself, having that opportunity. I also think you gave a, a smashing talk today. I think that um, it was a message that oh, everyone needs to hear and think about and uh, debate. What you said was not without provocations in a very constructive manner. Um, I like also, you know, the metaphor of both activists and academics. I'm also a radical academic that we shed our skins. And um, the question I have, I think, is, is, is a small question, but it's rather broad. And uh, it's in the spirit of the question already asked about, how do you think about Latin America? How do you think about other places, including Iran and the Middle East? Um, what about Occupy and so forth? And that's simply to, to leave us with some sense of uh, how you see the sort of world balance of forces, particularly the social movements on a world scale. Well, I'd echo the thanks for a great talk and really uh, finished your book this week and really enjoyed it and uh, thanks very much. And I think it is true, it is very refreshing to have an academic that is prepared to stand up and take sides and be open about where you stand. I think it's brilliant and the whole notion of liberation geography. And I think also what's, what's great is, and I echo what Loki said earlier, I think the danger that some of the left has if it doesn't understand who the real enemy is at any one time, you know, whether those that think that Assad is in some way the anti-imperialist force in the region and actually therefore does not back the revolt, I think of making a severe mistake that actually has been made historically in the past with the state being described as a progressive state that we've all got to get behind 
and actually not understanding the power of the revolt to not only bring down that regime, but to be an anti-imperialist force in the region. I think it's absolutely, absolutely vital. And I think we don't want the left to fall into that trap. And I think you're right. Theory can follow events. I mean, Marx famously changed his theory about understanding, can you take over the state or do you need to create after the Paris Commune? And I think we should learn from that about the state. Certainly, I was lucky enough to report for Socialist Worker a number of times over since the first days in Tahrir Square. And what people said to me, they did want rid of Mubarak, but it was the regime. The slogan that you quote in Arabic, it's the regime. And so people talked about it as being like a cobweb of the state. But all the little Mubaraks, every institution, every university has its state person there and they want to get rid of all of that. They had more aspirations than just knocking the top off and keeping the state. And I think that's why the, you know, the revolution is a long way to go still, hasn't it? This process is still unfolding as you described. And I don't think that should stop people writing books about it as it goes. You know? But I think that brings us to the question of really who is the enemy now and what's happening in Egypt. Because if we're saying we want rid of the state, if we want to say we do want to have a genuine change, then actually that means that we have to understand who the real enemy is. And actually just talk about the Muslim Brotherhood as if they are the counter-revolution and the old regime. It's a severe mistake, as comrades have said. Do we actually think that we should have voted for the Mubarak's Prime Minister, the last Prime Minister, the regime? Of course not. Actually, some elements of, of the old Communist Party in Egypt did call for that, did call for a vote for Ahmed Shafiq. I mean, this is absolutely giving away the revolution to the other side. If we understand the Muslim Brotherhood as being an organisation full of contradictions, a reformist organisation, we shouldn't be scared of that just because they have got a religious name, and actually that sense that the leadership of them who are prepared to do deals with the IMF, you know, with Israel even, and etc. But actually the bulk of ordinary members who are working class, who are young people, who fought on the streets, who camped out in Tahrir Square, even though their leadership didn't call for support for the revolution in the beginning, these are people the left can engage with. And our Egyptian revolutionaries who are here this weekend have talked about that. I've talked about how, when the danger of the revolution is there for the counter-revolution, remember, they wouldn't even be in parliament or in a presidency without the revolution. So they are actually reliant on the revolutionary forces, even though at the same time they're in a contradiction where they want to hold back the revolution and stall it. So actually for us, those contradictions are exposed. So the president becomes a president, workers go to the palace and make demands. I was there too, the day after the parliament first sat. The streets were filled with people with their petitions and saying, what about the martyrs? Making demands. And in those ways, people can learn lessons and actually take the revolution forward while revolutionaries and socialists maintain always our independent organisation, publication and ideas to take the revolution further than they will ever want to take it. So, uh, I'm a card-carrying conservative, but I'm also a Muslim, so I guess I'm in the unique position of being the nightmare of both Anders Breivik and everyone else in this room. I'm afraid. Uh, I actually just want to um, perhaps uh, pick up on the analysis that um, Mr. Ed Bash talked about earlier, which is um, how the, occupying the public squares, like Tahrir Square and the um, uh, University Square in Yemen, for example. Um, I think I, I totally agree with that, but I think I would go um, talk about perhaps the role of the military. I think perhaps underplayed that. In Yemen, for example, it was only really when um, General Ali Mohsen defected, uh, or partially defected to the opposition, that um, suddenly there was the, this movement that actually, yes, we can get rid of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. I think certainly in Egypt, really only when the military stepped in that the, the uh, revenue succeeded. In Syria, it, it was. The, the ultimate um, fall of Bashar al-Assad will come when there is a critical mass of, of soldiers defecting to the Free Syrian Army or, or, uh, or leaving, the, leaving their weapons down. In Tunisia as well, um, uh, um, Ali, um, that, Ali he, was, um, he was essentially forced to leave when the military refused to fire on the protesters. So I think perhaps that's that maybe something that's uh, really quite important, significant, and, and it's important what, to find ways to try and encourage military the soldiers to defect. I very like quickly touch on the point of imperialism. I guess nobody will agree with me on this. But today Libyans are voting on uh, to, to vote for the General Assembly. Does anyone here really think that if we had abandoned them in Benghazi, we'd allowed Gaddafi's tanks to go into Benghazi and, and kill hundreds or thousands of people, do we think that we, they would be here today voting for the General Assembly? And do we do we think that um, we should sit here and judge those who decide to take up weapons or decide to call for intervention against the Bashar al-Assad um, regime. It's very easy for us to sit here and criticise um, criticize those people, but in reality, those people are fighting for their lives. They're fighting for, um, for, basic, for basic human dignity and freedom, which conservatives and people from the left can both agree on. Um, and I think it's something that perhaps uh, is too much underplayed this too much sort of overplayed this imperialist ideology 
the talk of imperialism, which I can understand, but it becomes a situation when basically, I, I was talking to someone from Stop the War Coalition, basically his argument was, it's okay to kill your people so long as you're killing your own people. So it's not okay, uh, it's, it's fine for Bashar al-Assad to continue because that's his country. Basically he owns the country, but, it's, but it's, you know, we should criticize it if it's um, the NATO intervention forces going in. Um, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you uh, for all those wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation, uh, ideas and comments. And before I say anything else, uh, I'm of course honored uh, by all your presence, but I must acknowledge here, I'm particularly honored to be in the presence of Ms. Gada Karmi, the distinguished Palestinian novelist whom I have always loved and adored uh, because of her extraordinary work. It's, it's a great honor to be in your presence, Gada. Now, there's so many wonderful questions. I never came here with the illusion that I'm going to teach you anything, but I didn't know I'm going to learn so much. Uh, let me, uh, I mean, I can't do justice to all of these wonderful comments, but let me try to do as much as I can uh, within the time limit, uh, some of the very uh, poignant uh, issues that have been raised that I think we in the left will continue to grapple with them for quite some time. As you know, we in New York have a sort of a sister organized event called the Left Forum, uh, similar to yours. And I think these gatherings have to be multiplied. We have a lot to talk about. And these sort of annual Hajj pilgrimages, if I were to use the metaphor, are not sufficient. Much is happening, and we are much in need of conversation with each other. Take the question of public space that I uh, suggested. In no way my suggestion that we, particularly in the Arab and Muslim world, need to occupy the public space in a systematic, enduring and organized manner that I suggested in the formation of labor unions, <coughs> independent labor unions, women's rights organizations, <coughs> and student assemblies means that the state is not important. We, particularly in the Arab and the Muslim world, come out of 200 years of usurpation of a state by illegitimate state apparatus that has ruled over us, denied us our civil liberties, collaborated with, uh, with imperialist powers, and uh, you should never have the anxiety that I will let the imperialism off the hook, uh, and uh, given us the false illusion that now we have nation state and uh, Muammar Gaddafi is our uh, representative and uh, this and that. No. My uh, position is simply to reverse, to reverse the relationship, not by uh, the uh, state takeover, which can be usurped, but by building from the ground up. In a way, theoretically, you may suggest that I'm creating a, a rapprochement or maybe a a rendezvous between Hannah Arendt and Trotsky. Occupation of public space, transformation of public space into institutionalized voluntary associations along the lines that I suggested, in order to perpetuate the revolution. Let me give you the specific example of uh, the, the, the most recent Egyptian presidential election, uh, along the lines that was su su uh, suggested that Morsi is a step forward. If the army had its way, and some of our very distinguished names uh, on the left, as early as a year ago, they said, oh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, the, the army, they have, a, they have an arrangement that they stole in the revolution. The fact is, if the Egyptian army had its way, Hosni Mubarak would be in power today. If the Egyptian army had its way, Omar Soleiman would be in power today. If the Egyptian army had its way, Ahmad Shoghi would be the president today. The reason that the army has had to back up step after step is the presence of people in Tahrir Square, some of whom are Muslims, uh, active or believing Muslims, many of them consider themselves secular, Marxist, <coughs> left, etc. Look at the combination of the, of the election. You had a Nasserite socialist coming with 20% of the elected vote. Was that a joke? Compare that with the Iranian revolution of 1979, that thousands of the leftists were 
collected together and point blank massacred by Khomeini in the dungeons of the Islamic Republic. I am happy that Ahmad Shoghi ran for president. So 30 years from now, we wouldn't have the son of Shah saying, oh, uh, emerging as a nostalgic figure, let me go back and save Iran. No, Ahmad Shoghi had a chance representing the army, the back carrier of Hosni Mubarak, and told Egyptians what he had to say about the, the future of Egypt, and he lost. Finished, halas, as we said. We move forward. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood are, first of all, Muslim Brotherhood is not a, a, a monolithic event, a thing. It has all sorts of internal uh, uh, dynamics. Yes, the Saudi money is pushing the Salafi, and the right wing, and the new liberal faction of the Muslim Brotherhood. But that is not the entirety of the Muslim Brotherhood. What is the Muslim Brotherhood president going to do with Israel? Is he going to honor the peace treaty with, uh, 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 and economic agreements with Israel or not? Whatever they do is to the benefit of the revolution. Now, apropos the question of Israel, as I, now that I mentioned it, Israel, it is in the political DNA of Israel, unfortunately, to only be able to deal with Arab potentates. Israel doesn't know how to deal with Arab democracy. Because Arab democracy, like any other democracy, is open-ended, is chaotic. You never know what will happen. Israel is constitutionally incapable of dealing with that chaos. That's why they are creating this fabricated issue of Iran nuclear uh, battle. It's a diversionary tactic. The United States is supporting them, is, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, 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 supporting them in order to pull the political situation to the status quo ante. Oh, uh, Iran nuclear war, Ahmadinejad, this, that, etc. No, it's a smoke screen. The real event is the Arab revolution. Keep or our eyes on the ball. We should not be fooled. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapon. Israel has nuclear weapon. Two hundreds of them. <laughs> this state of war is also beneficiary to the repressive regime in the Islamic Republic. As one of uh, our friends just said, Three years ago, masses of millions of Iranians poured into the streets demanding and exacting their civil liberties. They are integral to the Arab Spring, the, the Green Movement, the Arab Spring. Three years ago, I had quarrels, dear friends, comrades on the Arab left telling me, oh, these uh, Iranians with, with the northern Tehran with their uh, hairdos and uh, blonde hair, they're, they're all bourgeois. Nonsense. 63% of the Iranian student entry entrants are women. Only 12.3% of women are part of the labor force. That has nothing to do with Ahmadinejad, it has to do with the oil-based economy. 50%, one out of two uh, students who leave uh, universities, women, they go home living with their parents. They cannot leave until they find a husband. Which husband? 35% of the unemployed are the age between 15 to 29, namely those who can't marry and, and uh, have a family. So the only people who are actually capable of marrying, renting an apartment, forming a family, are those hired by the repressive state apparatus, divided into three militarized security and, and uh, uh, militarized apparatus, the, the uh, Pastoran, the Basij, and the Hezbollahis. They are the only ones. In other words, give you another example. Uh, three million participated in the, inter, uh, the national entrance, uh, university entrance in the year 1997. The entire capacity of Iranian universities was 240,000, namely less than 10 percent. 90 percent poured into the streets without education, without any job opportunities, and they are absorbed into this militarized security apparatus. In other words, in Instead of uh, uh, investing in job creating opportunities and universities, a, a regime that is conscious of its illegitimacy is investing in a security apparatus. So the state of war created between Israel and Islamic Republic and Saudi Arabia, or the Sunnis and the Shias and this and that, is entirely fake, is entirely diversionary. Diverting our attention from the fact that we have a transnational uprising 
that in which Iranians and, and Arabs, they, uh, despite the fact that they don't speak the same language, in answer to, uh, to, a, the, to a question apropos of the Iranian attitude, the Iranian attitude was the last time thousands of, tens of thousands of Iranians put into the streets, called by demonstrations by Bir Hussein and Musavi, was in support of the Arab Spring, in solidarity with the Arab Spring. They brutally repress it, and then they say, oh, this uh, awakening is an, is an Islamic awakening. Morsi is on the record for hating Shi'is more than he has objections to Jews. This is the current president of Egypt. What kind of Islamic awakening is that? I mean, the magnificent aspect of this revolution is that all of these hypocrisies are just, just uh, coming out and, and me being melted. The, day, the hour that Morsi takes off, uh, office, a major pro uh, 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 Pastoran news organization in Tehran fakes an interview with Morsi. Oh, we are so happy that now we, we and Iranians are all in solidarity. It's a joke. They had to take it back. Morsi's office said we never had an interview with the <laughs> Islamic Republic. So we need to keep our eyes on the, on the ball and not to be di diverted by these things. Uh, the question regarding Latin America. Latin America is another phase of hypocrisy. Look at Chavez. What the hell is Chavez doing, uh, having on being on a frequent flyer with Ahmadinejad? What sort of a solidarity is? I mean, look at Cuba. What is uh, 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 Comrade Castro doing, giving honorary degree to Ahmadinejad? It's obscene. It is not that they don't know. Labor activists in Iran keep sending messages to both Chavez and to uh, Castro regime. They just couldn't care less. It's not that they don't know, they know. But they, again, because they cannot create a balance between how to fight against imperialism and support. And, and as I said years ago, either Ahmadinejad will corrupt Chavez or Chavez will liberate, come to the aid of labor union activists suffering in the dungeons of the Islamic Republic. In the Islamic Republic, they, when labor activists want to organize conferences in support of the Occupy Wall Street, they don't allow them. But then they send messages of solidarity. They just had an organize, uh, a conference in Tehran University in, uh, in, uh, in support of the Occupy Wall Street. This is a moment that all these hypocrisies come out. There is a fundamental congruous of interest between Eurozone crisis, Occupy Wall Street, and labor movements that are integral to these uprisings. Now, labor unions in Iran were, had every legitimate reason to be suspicious of the Green Movement. It's nothing wrong <coughs> because they have never uh, sought in those uh, slogans their own aspirations. But they have, there has been a sustain for 30 years, a struggle for the specific union question. As of last week, there were uh, uh, tens of uh, labor union activists gathering in Karaj in the suburb of Tehran. They were violated and raided, and some of them were arrested and put to jail. Islamic Republic and anybody else in the region, they're far more afraid, far more afraid, as they, as they said to the revolu Egyptian revolutionaries, of labor unions than new liberals. They told the, the, the so-called seculars. The term secular, religious, and all of that has to be thrown out. And uh, we need to think more radically about what it means uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be revolutionary. Now, apropos uh, Libya, the, the, the friend who, uh, who said I'm a conservative and, and so forth, the conservative also needs to be rethink. Asking us, asking us if we oppose this election that is taking place today, and whether or not uh, we would have liked this uh, for uh, Libya to have succeeded uh, uh, Gaddafi if the American NATO intervention did not exist. Mm -mm. As I said on the moment that when, uh, when uh, US and NATO were organizing the, the, uh, the attack against Libya, my position was, I don't, I'm a citizen. Why should I give my moral voice to Obama or to NATO? I didn't sell masses of millions of arms to Gaddafi, the remnants of which are collecting dust in arms manufacture company in the US. Why should I now give an opinion? I didn't write articles unless some of my, uh, unlike some of my colleagues here, both 
in US and UK, saying that Gaddafi's regime was the Norway of North Africa. <laughs> Why now should I lend my moral, the only thing I have is an independent moral voice, to that conservative friend. I said, if US invades, I will call Obama an imperialist. If they don't defend the civilians, I call them, I hold them responsible. Because he sold the arms, I didn't sell the arms. The shoe is on the other foot. We are not, he said, no, if Obama is on the phone, what would you say? I said, did Obama ever consider me and my thought? <laughs> they said my website and my uh, Facebook is under surveillance. I said, I hope they read it. <laughs> And they, and they do as I say, not to. <laughs> so, uh, so no, no, they, they, we are delighted that the Libyans are going to things, but this is not to the credit of either Gaddafi or the Americans or the NATO. No, we hold them responsible for every single innocent life of Lib Libyan that was lost in the course of this revolution. All of these revolutions have started peacefully by ordinary people, and it is precisely those ordinary people that will triumph. Right now, the fight between the Saudis and the Iranian regime, uh, the, the friend who was asking about the, uh, the, the, uh, the Iranian regime, and yes, you're absolutely correct, there is a collusion of interest of Americans and Islamic Republic in Iraq. Iraqis, our brothers and sisters in Iraq, have been denied their own right of toppling their own bastard uh, tyrant. And uh, oh, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Paul Bremer writing the constitution for them. Who the hell is Paul Bremer? <laughs> Iraq is one of them. Is the cradle of civilization. One of the most magnificent intellectuals of the uh, uh, last two centuries of the Arab world have come from Iraq for Paul Bremer uh, to write the constitution for them. <laughs> this is a country from which the very alphabet of world has come. For the, who, who are they? Who are these people? With the pigeon uh, Arabic and the, the, the insha'Allahs and the this and the that. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we are running out of time. Sorry if I didn't answer uh, some of your questions. I share your enthusiasm. <laughs>